Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Up and to the Right. My name is Crystal Manu, and I'm so thankful that you are listening and watching from wherever you are. Now, today's episode is going to be a little different. A couple of weeks ago, we had the opportunity to welcome Rabbi Moshe Rothschild from the Israel Alliance, where he came and conducted a teaching over the mysteries of Hebrew. And he talked about how the Hebrew language and understanding it better can really increase our prayer life. His teaching was so good that so many people requested a copy of it. So we are gonna do this in a three-part series. So make sure after you listen today that you come back next week and the week after for parts two and three. Listen and be blessed. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, I remember when I, was, when I was in high school, we had a, when we were in 12th grade, they had this evening where we would stay over in school the entire night, and we'd have all kinds of activities the whole night. So I was responsible for hiring uh, an entertainer. So I found a guy with, uh, with a, he was a, a memory expert. He could come in, he would ask every kid in the school their birthday, their names, and so on and so forth, and then he would get up and he could literally spew back all the information, and it was like extraordinary. I saw him, so I thought it was really cool, so I hired him. So the night came, and uh, he was supposed to come at 2 o'clock. It was 2, 2.15, 2 2.30 a.m. He doesn't show up, and I call him up. You know, where are you? And he told me he forgot to come. <laughs> so one thing I learned from that true experience is that before you actually hire or listen to someone, you should know who they are and what they're about. So basically, I grew up in New Jersey, um, and... Uh, uh, after uh, graduating college, became a rabbi, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi, and then spent my career teaching in Jewish schools and then becoming a congregational rabbi in Perth, Australia, and in Miami, Florida. We had a very large congregation in Miami, and then 14 years ago, we, my wife and I and three kids and a very large dog moved to Israel. We now have four kids. Um, we traded the dog for a kid, um, and uh, most days it's a good trade. Uh, and we uh, we live just south of Bethlehem, is Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and then where we live in a town called uh, Ephrat. So uh, my kids all grew up in Israel. They were very little when we moved, and. Um, And so when I got there, I had to try to figure out what I was going to do to make a living. Rabbis moving to Israel, that's not a big deal. That's like a snowball moving to Alaska. There's a lot of rabbis there. And uh, so uh, I became a tour guide. I thought that would be synergistic. And I started to meet Christians. And eventually, they started to invite me to their churches to speak and wherever. And then it eventually morphed into an organization called the Israel Alliance, Um, which should be up on the screen, Um, which basically is the name of the organization trying, where we try to build bridges with Christians, Jews, and uh, and Israel uh, together. Um, And that's basically what I'm doing, you know, in in my travels. My son Ezra, who's with me, Ezra's going to the Israeli army. Every every 18-year-old is drafted, boys and girls, for two years and nine months into the army. And uh, when they're 16, they get their first call up to the army. When they're 18, they have to serve for almost three years. So Ezra's, Ezra's drafting August 13th. Uh, if he gets his way, he'll be in the tank units. And uh, for three years, he can't leave the country when, when you're an active soldier. So he's here with me uh, traveling to Oklahoma City. Um, so in any event, with all that background, let me, let me just share with you something that has become a great passion of mine. I've been teaching about this for years uh, online around the country. And that is the, the, what I call the mysteries of Hebrew or the secrets of the Hebrew Bible. Okay, whenever I call it the secrets of the Hebrew Bible, people always ask me, really, does the Bible have secrets, right? Why do you call it that? So, of course, it's just, it's a way to get people excited, but hit, hit the screen, Ezra, please. So, there's a, a verse from Psalms, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. So, the Hebrew, is, the Hebrew word is sowed, which means the secret. So, it seems to me there are secrets, but they're only accessible to those who fear him. But let's, uh, let's understand that If you don't understand what the Hebrew says in the Hebrew Bible, then you're basically, 
uh, it's like hugging God with a big, thick winter coat on, okay? Or imagine, as I said the other day, imagine you are, have a, 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 someone you love dearly, a child, a spouse, and for 10 years, you're speaking to them through a translator because you don't speak the same language as your wife or your husband. And you're speaking to them, and there always has to be a translator there. Now, you're not sure if the translator com is completely reflecting what you're saying. And number two, you can't connect directly to the person. And after 10 years, imagine you learned their language, and now you speak to them directly. Your, the level of your relationship would go, go higher. Do you understand the Hebrew Bible is 929 chapters, over 23,000 verses, over a million letters. It is almost four times the length of the New Testament, the Christian Bible, whatever you want to call it. It is a very long book, and it's written almost exclusively in Hebrew. There are a few chapters, the book of Daniel, that are in Aramaic, which is a sister language to Hebrew. Okay, And so if you can access the Hebrew, it could be a whole new level. So for example, right, if you remember back, some of you are probably still in high school or elementary school, but if you remember back studying English literature, maybe you learned Shakespeare or Chaucer or you read American poets like Robert Frost. And I remember sitting there in fifth, sixth grade reading, you know, a, a Two Roads Diverged in the Woods, you know, a Robert Frost poem. And then the teacher would spend the next three days saying, well, it doesn't really mean two roads. It really means two uh, that a person has a crossroads in life, they can't decide, should they go this way or that way? And I'm sitting there thinking, did the poet really mean that? You know, did they really mean that? And, and they're going through Shakespeare and all this poetry, units on poetry. And the, the truth is, as you get older, you realize they did mean that. Or you read books by, by uh, say, George Orwell, we read in high school, 1984, Animal Farm. And it's not really about an animal farm, it's about something else. So if you think for one second that a human being can create imageries and layers of meaning, do you not believe that God does the same thing with the, with the Bible? So that a five-year-old can read it and an 85-year-old can read it and they can get they can get something out of it, the deep messages of it that maybe a five-year-old isn't going to get, that a 20-year-old or a 30-year-old is going to get. So the Bible is, a, in my mind, it's not a good word to use. I'll tell you why, because it comes from the word biblio. Biblios is like a, a book. Okay, a book has a beginning, a middle, and an end. The Bible has no beginning, middle, and end. The book is always speaking to you. It's a living document. Okay, when you think of a book, you think, it's finished. I'm done reading it. You close it and I'm done. And maybe you want to, you know, maybe you'll review it. But the Bible is always speaking to us. And there's always layers of meaning. And if you can crack the Hebrew, it's unbelievable. So I'm going to show you some things here. As I mentioned, the church, and hopefully I think they're going to blow your mind. When I even showed my kids who are Hebrew speakers, they were like pretty stunned by some of the things. Okay, but first, a prophecy from the book of Zephaniah, Ezra that says, for then uh, I will restore to the people a pure language that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. Zephaniah is referring to the Messianic age. It's Messianic prophecy. And both Christian and Jewish scholars believe when he refers to the pure language that everyone will speak the pure language, he's, he's speaking about Hebrew. Okay, He's speaking about Hebrew. There's a common language. What happens in the story of the Tower of Babel? What happens? God disperses them, and they speak multiple languages so they can't connect with each other, right? It's the beginning of time, right after the, 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 the flood story. And then at the end, Zephaniah is saying they're going to come back together as one people through one pure language. It's like the closing of the bookends, okay? Now, so chapter 1 of Genesis, it says nine times God said, right? What's the first time? God said, let there be light, Okay? God said, what language was he speaking, right? What language was he talking, right? So both Jews, Christians, scholars all will tell you that he's, the language of the Bible, the language of creation is Hebrew, right? He, language can create, right? Anybody here who's a teacher or a parent knows this, right? If you see a child that is really suffering because they're thinking, oh, my grades are terrible, and the teacher comes over to that kid and says, you know what? I know you might be struggling a bit now with your grades, but I have a lot of confidence in you. You're a really smart kid, and I know you're going to turn it around. And that kid perks up. 
You've now used your words to create the same way that God said, God said, God said. The message here, part of it is that your words can create, create realities. Okay, now Ezra, hit it, please. So I just want to show you a few things. Hebrew is called Lashon HaKodesh, or the holy tongue. Why is it called that? So there's two reasons I'll share with you. One, the simple one is it's a language of creation, which makes it a holy language, okay? And a, as I mentioned, God says in Genesis, nine times uh, God said, right? Go on, Ezra. Now, let's show you something fascinating. You see the magician on the board there? What does a magician say when he wants to do a trick? Just yell it out. Abracadabra. Congratulations, you all know Hebrew. Okay, put it up, Ezra, hit it once. Abracadabra. The Hebrew is abracadabra, which means I will create as I speak. That's what it comes from, the Hebrew. And I showed you, now I've learned uh, that for people who can't read Hebrew, you can match. You can match the blue is abra or abra with the Hebrew letters. Now, by the way, I noticed the first Hebrew letter, which is this letter here, it looks like the North Church logo. <laughs> I, when I came in, I'm like, why do they have a letter Aleph on their logo? Okay. Uh, in any event, so abracadabra, abracadabra was stolen or taken from the Hebrew because I will create as I speak. Okay, one more, Ezra. So bara means to create. You see the blue characters. You don't have to be able to read Hebrew, but you can see the characters. Okay, once more, Ezra, right? And so you, you see the matches, right? Create, my words create. That's what abracadabra, abra, which is future tense. I will create as I speak, okay? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> That's like, people, people don't know where abracadabra comes from. Okay, hit it, Ezra. Next one. Okay, go on. Keep going. What's that? It's lagging, okay. So, so I won't show you that one. Okay, so the na <laughs> this is, these are the characters of the Hebrew alphabet. It's a beautiful script, and it, 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 I actually have studied to become a, a uh, scribe, but it is not so simple to, to write, okay? Hit it, Ezra. <laughs> I gotta give them like notice in advance. It was working fine on, on a Thursday. It was not lagging. Okay, so this is what's called a Torah scroll. These are the scrolls and they use those characters to write them in the scroll. In a Jewish synagogue, we take out the scr scroll and we read from the scroll, hit it. Now, oh gosh, this is a, we're gonna lose a lot of time like this. Mm. Okay, so you could see it closer. Okay, keep going, Ezra, hit it. And... Da -da. Okay, watch this. This is a little video of a scribe writing the letters in a scroll in the same way for thousands of years. If you hit it, it'll play it automatically. I think it should. Okay, there it goes, abracadabra. <laughs> so you, you, could see, you could see him writing and why it takes a full year to write a Torah scroll, which is only the five books of Moses. It takes a full year to write uh, a scroll. And he's writing on a parchment. This is a special scribe writing on parchment, um, the ancient Hebrew letters. Okay, as we go to the next screen, and just so you understand, <laughs> just to, I, I threw these next two slides in, and I thought it was kind of funny. The next slide, you just got to advance it past this. Okay. You have to, okay, here it comes. Any second now? Okay, if you go to eBay, for example, if you want, not eBay, Amazon, you want to buy a Torah scroll, 132,000 shekels, that's like $40,000 on a used one on a used one, okay? A new one is closer to 60,000. Hit it, Ezra, keep going. <laughs> oh my God, is there any way we could fix this lag here or, or something? Okay, so, all right. Maybe we could connect directly. Okay, look at this one, $28,000, but hit it, Ezra. This is my favorite part. Again, hit it. You have 
$18.99 shipping. <laughs> That's my favorite part. $28,000 we have to pay for shipping. They couldn't throw it in for free. Okay, so I stuck this up here. This is the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is the book of Isaiah. We uncovered all 66 chapters of Isaiah. 66 chapters. We found scrolls over 2,000 years old with the book of Isaiah, the same writing, and it matches exactly what we have today. I was talking to someone in the church before. She was telling me how she decided to try an experiment. She copied the first five chapters of the book of Genesis to see what would happen, and she made so many mistakes when she went back and looked at it. This is the book of Isaiah 2,000 years ago. matches what we found in what's called the Dead Sea Scrolls. You can go to Israel, visit this in the Israel Museum. Okay, any Hebrew reader, speaker, looks at it carefully can, be able, can, read, the, can read this scroll. Hit it. So um, this is all by way of introduction, and I want to now show you a whole bunch of examples from the Bible of the Hebrew. Okay, go on. We can skip the slide. That's a prayer book printed in, mod printed in Hebrew. Go on, Ezra. <laughs> okay, if everyone can get off the internet, maybe it'll go faster. <laughs> Turn off your... Okay, so now Hebrew words define their reality. So what do I mean by that? So in English, this is a chair and this is a table. It could just as easily have been reversed. That could have been a table and this could be a chair. Hit it, right? And, but in Hebrew, it's not true. The Hebrew words define the reality. So for example, the Hebrew word for a table is on your screen there. Keep going. Hit it. You know, can you bring the computer here? It'll be faster if I, if I do it. Um, Okay, so the Hebrew word for, for table is on your screen, and it's pronounced shulchan, but it's a contraction of two words, which in Hebrew, what do those two words mean? It means of kindness. So the word table in Hebrew means shelchan or shulchan, means of kindness. What is a table meant to be? It's not a place where, you're, where people are meant to dance on it or your kids are meant to argue over it or even to do their homework. It's a place of kindness where you invite people to break bread, to come to your house and to eat. It is the definition of what a table is in the Bible. What's the only other language that's similar to that would be the chemical language. H2O, which is water, right? H is two hydrogen mole molecules and one oxygen molecule. So the, the letters H2O define what it is. It's the same thing in Hebrew, right? Okay, so now uh, this is one of my favorite ones here, okay? Um, let's back that up a second, okay. What is the Hebrew word for scale in the Bible? Okay, I have it on top there, okay? It's okay, you don't have to be able to read it, but you see where it says scale, okay? Now, what's the Hebrew word for ear? You see it right underneath it. Now, look at the underlined letters in the word for scale in Hebrew in the Bible, and look at the letters for ear. Do you see those three letters are exactly the same? Okay? Hebrew works on a th what's called a three-letter root, meaning you build words off of the roots. So the Hebrew word for scale and ear is, from, is the same, really. And the question is, why? If in English I would say to you a scale and an ear, those, those words are unrelated. Why would the Bible call a scale the same thing as an ear? We're talking about a scale. We're not talking about one that's electric. We're talking about the scales like that. It, what, how are those words related? Listen to this. It, it is not until 1824 that they figured out that balance, human balance, is in the inner ear. Right? It's in the inner. Balance is based on the inner ear. So in other words, the Hebrew word for scale and ear is the same because balance is based in the inner ear. Now, you're gonna, I'm going to show you many examples of this. Okay, so here's another example from the Bible, the biblical word um, for I. Okay, it's on your screen, ayin. Okay, that's the biblical word for I. It actually sounds a little bit like the word I. And if you look, for example, you'll see I put it in red, those three letters in red, right, have uh, the same root, a fountain, like a water fountain, a deep fountain, 
right, has the, the word I in it. What's the relationship between a fountain and an I? So if you look at the eye, the different parts of the eye, probably 80, 90% of the different parts of the eye are involved in the production of fluid. So in the biblical Hebrew, the word eye and anything to do with water, a water source, a ma'ayan, a fountain, uh, underground water will have the same root as the word for eye. Okay? Now these are things they didn't know in the ancient world. Okay? So what I will make a, maybe it's a leap, but how do you know the Bible's written by God? Because it contains so much information that no human being knew or could have known in the ancient world. I showed you two very simple examples, but there's far more sophisticated ones. Okay, but nobody knew that the inner ear was a source of balance. People didn't know the parts of the eye two, 3,000 years ago. And why would the Hebrew relate the, the water and the eye because of the production of fluid in the eye. By the way, there's a book written by a university professor called Coincidences in the Hebrew Bible, and he puts a coincidence in, in a, in a he, he doesn't mean it really as a coincidence, but he's demonstrating all these, all these different words. And so what is, here's a cute one I threw in here. Who's man's best friend, of course? The Bible uses uh, the Hebrew word for a dog is a kelev, okay? Now, what does the word kelev mean? It, when you break it down, it means all heart, kulo lev, because the words define the essence of what they are. So, for example, the Bible says in the book of Exodus, when the Jewish people, the Israelites, left Egypt, what did the dogs do? Anybody know the verse? Anybody know? Or what, I should say what they didn't do. The Bible says, lo yecheratz kelev l'shono, not a single dog barked, right? They had... So later on in the Bible, what does it say? If, you're, if you find meat that's not kosher and you can't eat it, the Bible says, la kelev tashlichun, you shall throw it to the dogs. So the biblical commentators comment, so cute. They say that because the dogs were quiet during the Exodus, God rewarded them and says, when you have an agreement, you throw it to the dogs. So, but this is the Hebrew word in the Bible for kelev, kulo, lev. They're all heart. Um, any, anyone who has a dog's now? Okay, this is a great one. Okay, the Hebrew word used in the Bible in the Tanakh is for man is on your screen there. It's pronounced ish. But you can see there are three discrete letters in the Hebrew. By the way, Hebrew is read from right to left. Okay, from right to left. So you see three, you see the North Church symbol there on the right, okay? That's the, the first letter, okay? That's ish. Now, the name for a woman is isha. Now, pay attention, guys. You're going to love this. Right? These, those are the names in the Bible. Now, if you look very carefully between man and woman in Hebrew, you will notice what? What do they have in common? Two letters in common. Okay? I'll make it a little easier for you to see. I'm going to take out, you see what I just did? I took out one letter from man, and I took out one letter from woman, and I put them onto a separate line. So now you can see that man and woman, if you take out those two letters, they have they're in common, correct? Now, watch this. What do these two letters mean, the yud and the hey together? That's actually God's name. If you take out the name, if you take out God from the relationship between a man and a woman, what are you left with? Those two letters mean fire. It will burn up. Okay? So Ish and Isha, they're the same. If you remove God from the relationship between a man and a woman, you're left with those two letters, which is Ish, which means fire. Okay? And we have an expression in Hebrew, it says, Ein Ish bli Isha, there's no such thing as a man without a woman. Ve'ein Isha bli Ish, and you can't have a woman without a man. Ve'ein Shnehem bli Ashkina, and you cannot have the two of them together without the divine presence. Okay? So it's a partnership between man, woman, and God in our relationships. If you remove God from that relationship, then you're left with ash. You're left with fire. Did you guys follow that? Okay. Uh, that was uh, another example. Here's another one. Okay. Man in the Bible. Okay, who's the first man in the Bible? What's his name? Adam. Adam's not actually a name. Okay, it's not a name. It means... 
Uh, it, what, is, what does Adam mean? Okay, it means ground, but we'll get to that. But I want to show you something. What makes man unique? So if you look in, if you check the internet, one of the things that makes us unique is that we have a, a thumb, right? And we can grasp things in our hands. As, when I say man, I mean man, men and women. Women also have thumbs. Um, and you can grasp things, right? And that's one of the things that makes man unique to an animal. Uh, there's a term for the thumb. I can't remember, but there's this. So this is the Hebrew alphabet again, and those are the three letters for man, okay, mankind. Okay, you see how I circled them in blue, and they're, they're the same as the letters up top in blue. See, I have the system. Even if you can't read Hebrew, you, as long as you can see, you can understand what I'm talking about. So these are the three letters that make the word for mankind. The, 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 what makes Iman unique, we mentioned, was the thumb. If you, how do you say thumb from in the Bible? Are those three letters. Now look where they appear in the alphabet. One, two, three. Okay, it continues here. So the, the word for thumb is right adjacent to the letters for Adam, for man. Okay, you follow? So what makes Adam unique is that you have uh, a movable thumb that you can grasp things, and it appears that way in the alphabet. Okay, now, um, next slide. Okay, I think this one is my favorite. Where is the first time we see clothing in the Bible? All I heard was... <laughs> and I, but I'm, I'm sure everyone said the correct answer, which, of course, is Genesis and the story of... Uh, Adam and Eve, and they eat from the tree that they're not supposed to, and God fashions for them uh, uh, clothing, right? Okay, I'm not going to get into the story because you're all familiar. So now, what are the words in the Bible for clothing that we see? This is amazing. One word is the red word you see in front of you. It's beged in Hebrew or garment, okay? My picture on my screen is going to be too big because it's going to block. I don't know who's fixing that. What's that? Oh, you're, okay, good. Okay, the next one is, okay, is levush. Look in the blue, okay? It's fine if you can't read it. Okay, these are words used in the Bible in general for clothing. And there's a third word called me'il, which means a jacket, okay? Do you see those three words? Now, what is the word beged garment? Now look at this word. Same exact spelling. Bagad means a rebellion. Okay? Bagad means a rebellion. What is levush? Clothing. Bush, bosh means embarrassed. Right? In the garden it says they were naked and they weren't embarrassed. And then they were, so guess what? They had to get some clothes on. And then the last word, me'il, that word in Hebrew means to trespass. So all the biblical words for clothing in the Bible go back to the story of Genesis, right? A beged, your garment is a bagad, it's a traitor, right? Because you can't tell how fat I am with this shirt on because it's nice and baggy. But trust me, I've got a lot of excess tonnage under here, okay? So the, 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 your clothing is like a, it's a rebellion against what's the reality, okay? That's what clothing does. And what is Adam and Eve? It's a symbol of their rebelliousness against God's word, right? The word levush, like I said, clothing is, is the same root as the word to be embarrassed, like I mentioned before. And the word me'il, what did they do? Again, they trespassed the word of God. So all the words related to clothing go back to the original clothing in the Bible. Okay? You guys got all that. Okay, good. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, we'll do this one. Okay, so it says he breathed into him the breath of life. This is the book uh, from the beginning of Genesis. Okay, now, the word for soul in Hebrew nish, is nishama, or a soul. You see it on the screen there. But what I want you to notice is that it says when God breathed into him, right, he breathed into him, that's the creation of the soul, the soul of man, and the letters here are the same. And the word for breath in Hebrew is um, nishima, OK? 
Okay, I'm just seeing where I'm going with this, okay? Breath is nishima. So I just want you to listen carefully. Nishama, soul. Nishima is breath. Does anybody here do like meditation or anything, right? So it's all about calming through, through the breath, right? God breathed into you the breath of life, your soul. And so the word nishima, breathing, and nishama are the same words, okay? Now, the Hebrew word for name is on your screen there, and it's the center of the soul. The word for soul, look at it, and the two red letters, it's it means name, right? So your soul and your name are intimately connected, at least in the Bible it is, right? If you look, almost every time someone is born, they called him Judah. Why? Because they called him Reuben. Why? They called him Moses. Why? And they give the reasons. The name has a deep connection to their soul, okay? So the Hebrew word for name in the Bible and soul are very much connected, okay? So... This, okay, you got to really pay attention to this one. Okay, so the last verse of the book of Psalms, it says, let, all, let every soul praise God. Okay, you, you actually were singing that in church today, a little slight different version, where it was like, let everyone, I think the song was, everyone who has breath in him praise God. Okay, why did they say let everyone has breath and not everyone who has a soul in him in that song? Because nishama, your soul and your breath, are the same words. So whoever wrote that song, I don't know if they did it on purpose, but if you look, let every soul praise God, or you can say let every breath praise God. So that is why they developed an expression, you have to praise God for every breath you take. It's not just a police song, right? And so now, but listen to the play on words. Let every soul praise God or let every breath take God, praise God, right? So in other words, in the last 20 minutes, you've, we've all taken a lot of breaths. And really, our posture in life should be, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Your heart's beating, your kidneys, are, okay, it's all working. And we have to every second be saying thank you to God. So that's what it means, let every breath Every breath you take, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's our posture towards the divine, towards God. So that last verse of the Psalms is like a double entendre. Every soul should pray, praise God, or for every breath you take, you have to praise God because the word nishama or nishima, breath and soul, are the same. Okay? Um, okay, the Hebrew word in the Bible for world is up there. That's the whole world. Okay, and you'll appreciate this as, as people of, of faith, right? The, world, the word for hidden in the Bible is the same as world. Anybody want to venture a guess why that would be true? Because what does the world do? What does the, the scientific world do? A person looks at the world, the world of science, and say we can figure everything out, and it can very easily hide the presence of God. Right? Scientists believe they can figure everything out. The Russian cosmonauts went to outer space. And what did they say? We're up here in the heavens and we don't see any God up here. That's what they said. That's the first thing they said. We don't see any God up here. The world hides the presence of the divine. Right? You ever have an argument with someone who says, I believe in science? Well, I believe in God. Because the world can very easily hide the presence of God. And uh, the book of Isaiah, right? Indeed, you are a God who conceals himself, right? God conceals himself within what we call the natural order of the world, right? We don't see, right, of course, everything is a miracle. As they quote Einstein, there's two ways you can live your life. Either everything is a miracle or nothing is a miracle. Yeah, but everything in this world is a miracle, but it hides the presence of God, Right? You get in your car, and you walked between here and there, and the locomotion, all the muscles you needed to move, that's a miracle, folks. That is a miracle. There's, a, there's an ancient Jewish story told about this woman who was lighting the candles for the Sabbath. We light candles before the Sabbath begins, and she used her last bit of oil. She had no more oil left. She was a very poor woman, and then she was crying, so her father was very righteous. said to her, why are you crying? She said, because I have no more oil to light, light the Sabbath candles, and he said, okay. 
take vinegar and use that instead. She said, vinegar? Vinegar doesn't light. And he says to her, the same God who said that oil can light is the same God who can say vinegar can light. We just tend to see things as natural versus supernatural. But the word olam, ilam, hidden, it's, it's from the same exact word. Okay, now this is, I'll go through this one quickly. This is a father, okay, av. Okay, now watch what I do with this. The son is called a ben. Look at the last letter, the red of father. Look at the first word, first letter of son. It's the same. Grandson, now you have the son, the, the last letter of the word son and the first of grandson are the same. And then you have the great-grandson, you have the same thing. The last letter of grandson, the first letter of great-grandson are the same. So you see in the Hebrew the connection between the generations. This is over and over. Geza means a stem. Then you have a branch that comes out of the stem, and you see the last letter of stem and first of branch are the same. And then you have flower or a fruit has the same letter connected to the previous Word. There are dozens and dozens of examples of this in the Bible. To home is an underground cavity beneath the earth, right? It come, water comes out, and then you have a fountain and a river. So if you look at the progression of all these words, they're always connected to the previous word. My friends, this is divine wisdom. This is divine wisdom. You do not have this in other languages. Okay, this is a great one. Pay attention. Emet, it, in Hebrew, means truth. Okay, it means truth. How do you say a falsehood? It's called, in Hebrew, sheker. You can see the characters on your screen. It means a lie. Okay, that's a lie. Now, look at the Hebrew alphabet again. Again, reading from right to left. So the letters for truth is the first letter of the alphabet, the last letter of the alphabet, and the middle. Okay, they're almost, they're almost as far apart as you can possibly get. Okay, remember, you're reading right to left, and then you go to the next line. So you have the first letter, the middle letter, and the last letter. The word for, tr for lie, they're right next to each other, right? Why? Okay, I think it's pretty obvious once I tell you, lies are all over the place. Truth is few and far between. It's much more difficult to find truth than it is to find a predominance of lies in this world. Now, what you'll notice also is if you look at the words for truth in Hebrew, all three letters have a solid base. All three letters of falsehood are all wobbly. Right? You have, you have uh, the... Um, the one on the right looks like this, three, it's meant to come to a point. The middle one, you see it has, the middle letter has like two legs, but they're not the same height. And the last one comes to one point. Truth is built on three solid foundations. The word for lie is three unsolid, if that's the right word, foundations. Okay? All righty. I'll skip that one there. Okay, so here's um, another interesting one. They say there are three things that a person, you want to you look at someone or yourself and understand what you're all about. There are three things you look at, and these are three words used in the Bible. In green, you see it in green and red and blue, which means koso, kiso, kaso. You hear the, how they sound similar? Koso, kiso, kaso. What are they? Koso, kiso, kaso. One is when a person drinks. That's how you can tell, unfortunately, sometimes the truth comes out. Kiso is how they spend their money, right? What are, they, what are their values? And kaso is when they get angry. So those are the three things that you can tell a person's true character, koso, kiso, kaso, right? When they drink, the way they spend their money, and when they get upset, when they get angry, okay? Now, has anybody heard of this Havdalah? It's on the screen. It's in English. Anybody heard of that? Okay. So when Jews celebrate the Sabbath and the Sabbath ends, right, we have a little ceremony called Havdalah, okay? It's a ceremony to end the Sabbath. It doesn't really make such a difference. One of the things we do is we smell these sweet-smelling spices, 
Okay, you have the word there in Hebrew. Okay, it's pronounced bisamim. Okay, and my little cute little imagery there. And they'll be in these nice little boxes. You smell them. Now, let's go back to Genesis, right? What happens in the Garden of Eden when it comes to the sin of Adam and Eve, right? He said to the woman, okay, he said to the woman, okay, it's the sense of hearing. Neither shall you touch it, referring to the, the tree, okay, that's the sense of touch. The woman saw, right, said she, said she saw it was good and she desired it, that's sight, she took of its fruit and ate it. That's taste. You know what? The only sense that does not appear in that story is the sense of smell. People don't realize that. It's the only sense that does not appear in the story of the sin, the original sin in the Garden of Eden, is the sense of smell. So what do we do when the Sabbath ends? We take spices and we take the only sense that has not been corrupted, the sense of smell, and a way of comforting ourselves as the end of the Sabbath is using the spices to smell them. Now, what did we say earlier? God breathed into man the breath of life, right? But it says literally he breathed into his nose, into his nostrils the breath of life. So God, your soul enters through the nostrils, through the nose, right? And so that is the sense that has never been corrupted. God gives you your soul through through your nose, and that is the, the only sense that has not been corrupted in the Garden of Eden. How do you say in heaven in Hebrew? Look at the words in blue and black. They look exactly the same, don't they? Spices and in heaven are, is the same word. Why? Why was it related to the sense of smell? Because it's not corrupted. Your sense of smell was never corrupted. Bisamim and Bashamayim, right? It's the same exact letters pronounced slightly differently, okay? Now, I think that might have been my last slide. Wasn't that so good? Again, this is only part one. We are just getting started. So again, thank you for joining us today for Up and to the Right. I hope to see you again next week as we go into part two of Rabbi Moshe Rothschild's teaching. Have a good day.